And here we go. This is Flash at In a Perfect World on uh, the 11th of June 2019. And uh, we're Vinnyless at this point in time. So I'm going to do a I'm going to do a solo in the wee hours of the morning when everybody's sleeping. <laughs> and uh, I don't expect to catch anybody really uh, picking up 20 uh, in a perfect world this time of night because I'm way ahead on this time clock. Out here in Denmark, it is 8 a.m. in the morning. And I'd like to say thanks to Grim for helping me get the podcast up and out and the RLM crew for your reading extravaganza this evening, morning, slash, would be Barman, <clears throat> Beetle, Cowboy Tech, hey, CT, Grimnir, Moose Girl, Brackets DC, Anti, Asmo, Beth Z, Chow Sidoni, Ibi Donsi, Java Doctor 2, Meister Brow, Miss Kate, Rome's Vanna White, Weather Dork, the Phantom, Cyborg, Noodle, Dakota, Me, Frumpy, Graham Z, Gromit, Jays, Nines, Jays, Kiss, Kiss underscore, and Smataz, the bot. Well, at this time of night, a lot of, a lot of us leave the computer running and uh, don't shut things down. So I don't think there's too many people out there right now, but I'm going to do a, I'm going to do a solo in a in a perfect world this night and I think I'm gonna start out with let me see I've got a few links opened for this but I'm not sure where I want to start let me take a second to peruse ah I've got a good link I'm just waiting for the thing to open apparently the government wants people to believe as they always do the opposite of the truth and this little ditty is called experts call bullshit after coroner says healthy woman died in first ever THC overdose and it's uh, by government slaves on June the 7th 2019 and it starts out with a headline oh let me clear this throat quickly Anyway, it starts out with a clever little line. Let me close this stuff that's coming on it. Immigrate while you still can. It says, in what would be the first case of its kind, a Louisiana woman allegedly died from a THC overdose after vaping a large amount of cannabis oil. Okay. The New Orleans advocate reports that the otherwise healthy 39-year-old collapsed and died in her La Place apartment in February due to high levels of THC. The main... Oh, I better post this just in case Cowboy wants to read it. I think Cowboy's on. Uh, hold on here. I will go back in one moment. There's the link if you want to see it. Hmm. Back to my epic story. Okay, uh, no symptom, okay, the woman had healthy organs and no symptoms of illness or elevated traces of alcohol and drugs in her body. The coroner told the advocate it looks like it was all THC because her autopsy showed no physical disease or afflictions that were the cause of death. There was nothing else identified in the toxicology, no other drugs, no alcohol. I'm thinking this lady must have vaped this THC oil and got a high level in her system and it made her stop breathing like a respiratory failure. The woman's boyfriend informed investigators that she used a marijuana vaping pen to imbibe of THC and had been to the hospital three weeks prior to her death for a chest infection. The level of THC in her blood was 15 times the detection threshold for the compound, which led the coroner to conclude that her death was the result of a THC overdose. And don't forget, government or medical uh, guidelines are usually so misleading that, um, that 
the extremes. You know, the, this is this level is legal, and the level that they're talking about is ridiculous. So, hmm. I don't know what to make of this so far, but it doesn't sound true. Continuing with the story. While THC can cause heart palpitations and extreme anxiety in some users, the federally funded National Institute on Drug Abuse has said that no recorded deaths have ever, well, have been attributable to marijuana overdose. We know from really good survey data that Americans use cannabis products billions of times a year, collectively. Not millions of times, but billions of times a year. So that means that if the risk of death was one in a million, we would have a couple thousand cannabis overdose deaths every year. There, there's always some imperfection in these kinds of assessments. According to an official from the State Department of Health, this is the first death attributable to THC alone with our recorded deaths mentioning THC being in reference to combinations with other drugs. According to past estimates, a person would have to smoke over 20,000 joints to reach potentially lethal level of THC toxicity, the paper reports. The coroner, however, claims that the woman's death should give legislators pause when considering lifting the prohibition on recreational marijuana. Cannabis is still not yet legal in Louisiana for medical use, Monty Goode argued. If you've got a 30-day supply of THC in there with an inhaler, you can just keep puffing away. But for the former White House senior policy advisor, the woman's death may well have been just a fluke, Dis any, dismissing any need for concern, he explained. Let's assume that the woman died from THC is a fact. What do you conclude from that? It doesn't justify really anything from a policy viewpoint. It's just incredibly unlikely. And that's just a little, a little example of how far the, the state, the powers in charge, whatever you call this shit, will go to uh, mislead the public to get the anger and the division going so that, you know, something as harmless as cannabis could kill you if you vape it 30 days supply in a day or whatever. But it did add in there that she had been to the hospital for a chest infection. But they weren't looking for chest infection. They were looking for drugs and alcohol. And a lot of people may not be aware of that when you perform a medical test on somebody, it has to be specific. You don't just test them for everything. No, your tests are, we're, te we're looking for this, we're looking for that, we're looking for this. And if they don't find what they're looking for, it doesn't tell them what was there. It tells them they didn't find what they were looking for. Hmm. So just like everything else, I guess if they write it up properly and you know, they get the support of the people that are against things to support what they're against keeps the division going. And I believe most of the folks out there in the real world that are against whatever they're against have no idea what they're against. They're just against something. I'm against that because it's going to kill the children. Well, there's good news and bad news to that because everybody is going to croak eventually of something. Now, it's kind of strange to me that we live in this crazy world where, you know, volunteering other people to fight in wars or illegal banking practices that we all seem to collectively understand is something is horribly wrong with the banking. What is it? And you try to tell people, and just like we, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. The government would never do that to us. Yeah, it would. It would do that to anybody. It would do it. It eats itself. I mean, crying out loud, you got the Republicans hate the Democrats. Democrats hate the Republicans. The Republicans and the Democrats hate the independents. The independents hate everybody. Blah, blah, fucking blah. So it's just a matter of how you deliver a particular story to the, to the masses to get the result that you're looking for. 
And then we've got this internet thing. Hmm. The internet has definitely put a little hitch into the, uh, the mainstream, how it runs things and how it gets its way. But it's still so small. You know, there's so few people that are using the internet as a, as a source of information compared to the population. I'd sure like to know what the numbers are and how many logged on active computers there are in a 24 hour period. And then, I guess the NSA would know how many of those people that are using the internet, what they're using it for. Are they using it for gaming? Are they using it for um, communication to talk to family and friends? And then there's a few of us, probably 10% of the total, that use it like for smaller sites like reallibertymedia.com. I, I didn't even mention where we're coming from tonight. <laughs> uh, I'm a little nervous again because I know I got no Vinny to back me up. I took Saturday off to go to the to an extravaganza down in the downtown Saturday night. And it wasn't too awful bad. I did back out on eating the pig. Uh, I'm not real... I'm not a big food guy, and I had a couple of beers, and then my friends uh, were, hey, aren't you going to eat? And, yeah, I'll get to it, and I never did, And but after the meal, they had a, a three-man band come in and play some rock and roll, and the reason I mention this is I heard the guitar player warming up, and he was playing Voodoo Child, and I thought, wow, this guy is freaking great. And then the band you know, started to play, and then, of course, bar bands play the standard you know, rock and roll stuff that they're expected to play, I suppose. But I did hear behind the, uh, just behind the music, I could kind of tell like these guys were more capable of, of playing than they were actually doing, because they're just doing a small little bar. And... Uh, I want to do something with these guys. I'd like to see if they're interested in maybe doing a, a, a radio podcast of some of their live work. They're that they were that good, and they weren't young kids. They've been around the the circuit for quite a while, but they're very talented. You know, and talent doesn't get you anywhere in life anymore. It's not about that, and I believe these guys know. But uh, wow, they were really good. And I was really impressed. So give me three seconds. I got to go get something from the kitchen. I'll be one one thing. Hey, cowboy. Thanks for your patience while I was getting my thing from the kitchen. Uh, let's see. I got another link on here. Hold on. And I'll probably just do an hour and uh, Grim will put this up for me when he when he gets on and show me. He's going to show me how to do it myself so uh, uh, I can be more independent, I suppose, in the long run. You know, free him some of his time that he spends on me. And uh, just as I've gone along the radio, I was listening to me and Mary do an old Dork Table podcast from two years ago. And wow. Back then, I was saying, you know, I was uh, having other people host. My equipment wasn't all that good. I was going upstairs and using a small uh, laptop. And uh, me and Cirque decided, ah, why don't you just do it in the living room where all the good equipment's at? And I realized that if I made that decision, I'd have to <laughs> learn how to do some of this stuff myself. And I got a little uh, nervous about it. I'm not easy to teach all this computer stuff, too. It's a slow road for me. Now, I got me another link. And this one is about a battery that produces energy continuously since 1950. So I'm going to put a link, another link up for Cowboy Tech, I suppose, and see what happens here reading it. Well, let me post it first. So, anyway, we got... Yes, a battery that produces energy continuously since 1950 exists in a Romanian museum. Carpens pile humans are free. And the epic story goes something like this. Oh, wait, it was 
Yeah, free energy, recent articles, doesn't have a title for whoever wrote it. The Dimitri Leonodi, Leonoda National Technical Museum from Romania hosts a weird kind of battery built by Nicolae Vesalucu Carpen. The pile has been working uninterrupted for 60 years. I admit it's also hard for me to advance the idea of an over-unity generator without sounding ridiculous, even if the object exists, says Nikolai Diaconescu, engineer and director of the museum. The invention cannot be exposed because the museum doesn't have enough money to buy the security system necessary for such an exhibit. Half a century ago, the pile's inventor had said, it will work forever, and so far it looks like he was right. Carpin's perpetual motion machine now sits secured right in the director's office. It has been called the Uniform Temperature Thermoelectric Pile, and the first prototype has been built in the 1950s. Although it should have stopped working decades ago, it didn't. The scientists can't explain how the contraption patented in 1922 works. The fact that still puzzles them is how a man of such scientific stature, such as Vasil Carpin, could have started building something that crazy. The Carpin pile prototype has been assembled in, in 1950 and consists of two series connected electric piles moving a small galvanometric motor. The motor moves a blade that is connected to a switch. With every half rotation, the blade opens the circuit and closes it at the start of the second half. The blade's rotation time had been calculated so that the piles have time to recharge and that they can rebuild their polarity during the time that the circuit is open. The purpose of the motor and the blades was to show that the piles actually generate electricity, but they're not needed anymore. Since current technology allows us to measure all the parameters and outline all of them in a more proper way. A Romanian newspaper, ZIUA, The Day, went to the museum for an interview with Nikolai Gaikanescu. <laughs> Hard names to read. I don't read board names very well. He took the carpet pile out of its secured shelf and allowed the specialist to measure its output with a digital multimeter. This happened on February 27, 2006, and the batteries had indicated the same one volt as back in 1950. They had mentioned that unlike the lessons they teach you in the seventh grade physics class, the carpet pile has one of its electrodes made of gold, the other of platinum, and the electrolyte, the liquid that the two electrodes are immersed in, is high purity sulfuric acid. Carpin's device could be scaled up to harvest more power, adds Diaconassescu. <laughs> the carbon pile had been exhibited in several scientific conferences in Paris, Bucharest, and Bologna, Italy, where its construction had been explained widely. Researchers from the University of Brasov and the Polytechnic University of Bucharest in Romania have even performed special studies on the battery, but didn't come to a clear conclusion. The French showed themselves very interested by this patrimonial object in the 70s, I would assume 1970s, and wanted to take it. Our museum has been able to keep it. As time passed, the fact that the battery doesn't stop producing energy is more and more clear, giving birth to the legend of a perpetual motion machine. <laughs> wow, they're getting caught is what's going on. We've been had, folks, just like I always tell you. <laughs> Hurts to be right. 
Some scientists say the device, whoop, hold on a minute, had a little interruption here going on in my game. Uh, some scientists, where I lost my freaking place. Some scientists say the device works by transforming thermal energy into mechanical work. But Diaconescu doesn't subscribe to this theory. According to some who studied Carpenter's theoretical work, the pile he invented defies the second principle of thermodynamics, referring to the transformation of thermal energy into mechanical work. And this makes it a second-degree perpetual motion machine. Others say it doesn't, being merely a generalization to the law and an application of zero-point energy. Little over my head, but I'm trying to read along like I know what I'm fucking saying. If Carpin was right, and the principle is 100% correct, his pile would revolutionize all of the physics theories from the bottom up with hard-to-imagine consequences. <laughs> Though I guess this isn't going to happen very soon, the museum still needs proper private funding to acquire the necessary security equipment required by pol the police to exhibit the device. And there's even a, a, a video in the, in the link that has the operating machine. So I found that just a little bit interesting. And I'm also a believer that uh, the science that we're taught and the science that's available to us is very different from science. And the, the things that are real and things that actually work, all this theory stuff is... Uh, I believe it to be a distraction so that you'll go, oh, look at how good we're doing. We're so wonderful. We don't need to pursue this any further. We're perfect now, you know, like this uh, <laughs> global warming crap. And and the, the pattern is always in the change. It seems to me the government will make claims or, well, let's just call it government. Mary calls it, you know, the, <laughs> the powers that be this that and the other and I, I don't know what it is I haven't quite figured that part out yet it makes good sense that behind everything you know behind the big money there's there's a chess game going on and we're the pawns and the, the bishops and the knights but there's no king and queen in, in this game or wherever they're at we don't probably know who they are then they send out puppets like Trump and Obama and Bush and Clinton Oh, uh, you know, the usual suspects to sit in this epic fucking seat of power and decision. And it seems to me that any president, any sitting president that ever did anything that was good for the people was either assassinated or shot at one or the other. They tried to assassinate a few of them over the, the years when they were holding power and they didn't kill them. But wow. What would be big enough to support something that huge that would take uh, so much investment? It's not easy to kill a sitting POTUS. I mean, the CIA pulled it off, but before the CIA, who did it? Hmm, hmm, hmm. I personally have no idea. And we're losing people on the real liberty media one at a time. And... uh <laughs> Cowboy Tech's hanging in there, but Cowboy Tech's a late night guy. I usually run into him. Hey, there's Frumpy. Frumpy came back. Uh, I don't know if they know I'm live. I didn't know how to post the the live thing coming on. I didn't care. I just wanted to um, make my radio podcast and say what I got on my mind, and that was it. As far as uh, big crowds of people listening to the perspectives I hold, <laughs> share... I don't know. There's a few folks that believe the things I believe. Just there's not many of them because it's too far-fetched to think that whatever's going wrong is by design. No, no, no. The logic indicates that when something goes horribly wrong, why, it's a horrible accident. Why would anybody purposely do the horrible shit that they do? It doesn't make sense. Oh, here's another another thing is the French have been having the posting every week for about 30 weeks now, I think, give or take. 
the yellow vests are protesting against the powers that be in France. And the powers that be in France are responding to these French people with violence and prison and cages and handcuffs and whatever else they can come up with. Well, how come Trump's not in there attacking France for attacking France? Now, they make it up about other countries. Now, Syria's um, Assad is killing his own people with gas, and it's not him doing it. It's us, whoever us is, it's us doing it. It's not the people that you think are doing it. And here we go again, but nobody seems to be concerned because uh, I think the general consensus when I brought it up on the reallibertymedia.com chat, I got shut down pretty quickly with it, is France, France has got a central bank, Rothschild central bank, so then nobody gives a shit. I wonder if that's true. I mean, how how deep does all this stuff go that you can control people with out controlling them now? It's just uh, like a chain of command. Somebody up on top gives an order, and it filters down to the guy on the street, and then the thugs and the boots and the guns go out there and fulfill the the master's requirements. Hmm. Well, it doesn't stop the opposition. Nobody seems to want to stop opposition and sit down and, and discuss anything. There is no discussion in progress. And I think progress, like this battery story, that battery has been in this museum since 1950, and I just read about it like last week. Hmm. I wonder why. And it strikes me as odd that Tesla is from that particular part of the world, too. So... Tesla, according to what I read, he had himself a mentor. I forget the man's name. You guys that listen to me try to do radio got to understand that by now is my memory is not it's not as good as it was when, 20, 30 years ago. So I have to, today I have to read it right in front of my eyes half the time because uh, when I try to go off memory, I usually get a name or something wrong, <laughs> confuse people. Um, but the principle behind free energy, hmm. the, I think the word free scares people. That seems to be the enemy of that. Free technology, free energy. It leads you to communism and, that and, that and all this other shit. Well, why can't people take a good look at what they're in at the moment and figure out how it got that way without blaming a a political party. <laughs> political parties don't have nothing to say to anyone. It's it's a great idea and it's a great story, but true? I, I don't know. It's relative, I suppose. What could possibly be true if if it hurts people? Hmm. It's still true, I suppose. It's just not. Uh, it's not what's good for all of us. And when you say that, well, when you, when I say that good for all of us thing, I can just see people cringing in their seat thinking I'm some kind of communist and I want free shit and all this other crap. But look at the other side of that coin. Why do 300, let's give it 300. 300 people have all the freaking wealth. 300 families, let's say that. And all their offspring, and then they die, and they leave it to their relatives, and the relatives leave it to their relatives. And whatever's left over that they don't want to give up comes to about 7% of total finance. And we sit down here on the ground, you know, chipping away at the rock, trying to get our little percentage of the percentage so we can survive. And there's there's a, a kind of a, a link between Mary, Mary and me, Graham Z., we, over the years, have come to the decision that not that work is not necessary, but earning a living to survive in society, it shouldn't be punishable to not survive uh, on a certain financial level. But it is, and it's rigged. <laughs> oh, minimum wage is so and so and so and so. And if you have no education, and that's the kind of work you got to have, well, you can't even survive on that. So, 
what sounds, I don't even think it sounds like a lot, but what sounds incredible. Here's a guy working at a fast food or whatever, some kind of labor job. And he's making a whopping 15 bucks a fucking hour. But the guy he works for, <laughs> he's not making 15 bucks an hour. And on top of that, the higher you are in the food chain, the less you pay in taxes. And of course, if you've listened to me speak about taxes, I don't, I don't believe the taxes are real. I don't believe that anything gets done with taxes except for the illusion of paying the interest on the uh, Rothschild central bank loans that we were tricked, actually conned and tricked and lied to, to get. Why they didn't reverse this as soon as they came to session after that Christmas Eve in 1913, I don't get it. Why Why we've gone this far with it instead of abandoning it, I don't know. I know this. I don't want to play in it. Now, my wife, my wife knows how to play in that game. She's very good at what she does, and she likes what she does. So her, you know, her slavery to the state is different to her than my slavery to the state was. And I had a lot of jobs that, you know, I enjoyed doing over the years and financial ventures I would participate in. But I had the fortune of never um, never applying for uh, the uh, federal taxes. And uh, and what I uh, what I was told in in the eighties turned out to be true later was it's the application that traps you. And if you've been listening to read you know reallibertymedia.com or Maybe even minds. I don't know. There's a lot of sites out there with people that think like we think over at Real Liberty Media. But it's a very small group. And a lot of us just, we know. And having the knowledge is, it's just a part, small part of it. Being aware is nice and it's wonderful and it's cool. But you can't apply this unless you're willing to live outside of the law. And then they call you an outlaw because you have not applied to them for permission to be a part of their their thing. And that's what it takes. If you don't look for them, they don't know you're there. Then they got the internet. And now we're all on lists and the NSA is watching us and the CIA is doing that. And everybody's just, you know, <laughs> turn you in on some kind of uh, hotline, you know. If you see something, say something, that kind of crap, and wow. I live in a in a place where there are people that do that. Uh, I, they make jokes about it at the bar. I heard years ago when I first came here uh, about, yeah, some woman called the police. She saw somebody smoking hash, and the police said, well, take a picture and send it to us, and we'll investigate it <laughs> soon. <laughs> Which means uh, it doesn't pull enough weight to drag the cops out here to look for somebody that you didn't identify because you might have saw them do something. So I would assume from hearing that in the bar that the uh, the local people, wherever I'm at here in this little place, have evolved beyond, for the most part, not everybody. There's always going to be a percentage that support state. And there's going to be a percentage that say they support state, but truly don't. It's hard as fuck to be on the outside of this game, looking on it, or even like me, participating in it through marriage, and uh, to feel involved in it. I don't. I just feel as though I'm, I'm watching other people do shit. And the rules are so simple, you know. Don't spit at people and kick them and call them names and threaten them in public and, and act the fool. And what you'll find, in this place anyway, is uh, you get what you put out. And I've been an advocate of give people what they give you. You know, uh, when I've been accused of a lot of uh, verbal misbehaviors over my lifetime. I think it's how you you hear what the other person's saying 
And we use Hans as an example. Hansel, to me, is, uh, hmm, he's living in a world that I don't want no part of. So, it tends to make me negative when I see his input. And I comment, and I ridicule, and I say this and say that. But in the end of it, I don't really care. Uh, the things that I care about are the things I can put my hands on. And that, that mentality does not go very far. Uh, my world is extremely small. And I started out far, far away from here, where I'm at today. And I came here from another land, a foreign land. And the people talk funny, and I don't understand what they're saying most of the time. But I must say this. There's a demeanor in verbal encounters that when somebody's mocking or insulting, I can usually pick it up in the tone of their voice. The words, I've been mocked by people using pretty words to mock me. And if you were listening, some people wouldn't even know there was an insult there. It's you know a matter of interpretation and how you carry yourself, telling whoever is listening what you have to say. And I'm going to still stand on this. I started saying this at the dork table, and I'm going to continue. I truly believe, some part of me does, that communicating is the beginning of the problem. Because it opens up what ifs and what as and what about and what fors that don't really apply. And I, I'll say this because that battery has been in that freaking museum since 1950 working. And here we are. All these freaking years later, and people are still chasing their ass, looking for an answer that we already have. <clears throat> but I would probably assume from the components that went into making that battery, sulfuric acid and gold and platinum, that uh, there's probably regulation <laughs> prohibiting the use of these materials together because they're dangerous. And what I've learned over my lifetime is the things that they tell me are dangerous are actually not dangerous. And the things they tell me aren't dangerous are dangerous. Hmm. Where do you get an idea like that? <laughs> well, I don't know. Cannabis, chemotherapy, the two C's. Maybe uh, from cannabis to chemotherapy and everything in between. Seat belts, uh, speed signs, speed limits. There's no danger in driving a car fast. There's danger in driving a car fast poorly. It takes a lot of concentration <clears throat> and experience, maybe knowledge, uh, common sense, perhaps, uh, to drive a car quickly, fast, 100 miles an hour. But I've been in cars over 100 miles an hour, but I never did. I think the fastest I ever did was about 90 90 somewhere in there and then that was some part of me just went no this is too much i don't want to risk doing this because if i fuck up i'm going to roll this machine and everybody in it is going to go hey stupid <laughs> what were you thinking but uh the ability to do things is right there in front of us I, I haven't been in a new car lately but in the day i remember the speedometers reading 120 uh, as a top if you could Push that thing to the top, you'd see 120. I wonder how fast you're really going. Back in the day when we had real cars that ran on gas, anyway. I don't know what they're running on now. Some crappy version with additives in it. and They've done this and they've done that. So that by the time you pay for it, you're paying like three times, four times more than it's probably worth. And then... 90% of what you're paying is profit. So you, we're all getting screwed. I like saying that. Eh, we're all getting screwed. Woo, woo, woo. Um, I may be screwed is a matter of opinion. <laughs> I don't know. One man's uh, screwing is another man's profit. Let's see. We could always ask the Jews what they think. Because there's a, there's a big rush now going on with uh, the what's that? The nullhide laws. The Jews go have uh, a special <laughs> set of laws that you abide by, that they don't abide by. 
They can do whatever the fuck they want to do. Keep out who they don't like. Shoot who they don't want. Blah, 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 blah. And nothing comes of it. And nothing probably ever will. You know, this little fringe I'm on, we're knowledgeable and we understand things and that's all well and good. But the real world doesn't operate at this vibration. The real world is operating on a take hostages and murder and control and manipulate all the negative stuff. And the minute you start being kind to the next guy and wonder, hey, why can't they find water in Africa? Why can't these poor black people just get some water and build up their own damn country? Well, ever think maybe it's because uh, the bankers don't want them to. Hmm. I remember about 10 years ago. I can't remember names very good, but uh, if you remember that uh, actress, Isabella Rosalini. Well, she did an interview with this inventor man. I can't remember his name. Wealthy guy. Had a comes from a big family of money, but what he did was invented a, a machine that was about the size of, say, a small washing machine. And what it did was purified water. It would take mud water and filter out all the crap out of it and leave a drinkable source of water. And years ago, and they were talking about how affordable it was. They could put these in Africa and people would have access to clean drinking water. And to this day, I've never heard anything come of it. And that's the principle I'm on behind. Hey, what about the other guy? You know, I don't mind having a comfy life. I, I think I'm lucky to have a comfy life. Now, there's times where it wasn't comfy and I had to do other things to accomplish what I wanted. But for me, it was by choice. I, I've never been a victim of life. You know, Life didn't put me anywhere to suffer any fucking thing. But I don't think the same about other people. I think other people are played by the state or the government that, that holds their paperwork or whatever, their body. And, and, and things are manipulated to look certain ways to appease certain people and this, that, and the other. I don't know if this is going to go anywhere. It's just an, kind of one of my obscure thoughts uh, about fairness. You know, what, what is fair? Me and Cirque, uh, we got some vegetables and uh, strawberries growing out in the backyard. And we're probably the worst farmers in the history of farming. But yet, we go out there and we try. We do our little things, our watering and our little bit of weeding. And we seem to manage to harvest a uh, a vegetable or a fruit that's edible and in last year we weren't we weren't clear about the birds and the birds love the strawberries that Cirque grew they were just no and me and Cirque are kind of like well animal I guess people so we figured fuck it let the birds have the strawberries they're wild birds if what are you gonna do shoot a bird for eating food uh, and that kind of mentality is where I stand with people I could I could not stand to see somebody in, uh, in my daily life that didn't have any food. I'd feed them. <laughs> I'd share what I had with them. I'd do something. So fortune being with me, I, where I live, there's no homeless. Well, maybe uh, there is a couple, but again, these people choose to live the way they're living. They live on the beach. They don't want to be a part of the Danish society. They, they live on the outskirts of it. But they don't steal. They uh, they they forage for uh, aluminum cans and probably odd work. I I've yet to see them uh, do anything to anyone. They've lived here for years. Uh, I don't bother them. They've got a tent down at the beach. I've passed by it maybe two or three times in, in the time I've lived here. But I find there's two sides to this uh, little town thing, and I like the busier side where there's more. People and activity. A lot of people walking. Oh, like Saturday and Sundays. I, I like to go into the grocery and stop and have a beer out on the, the main street thing. And just watch people and see what they're doing. And a lot of them are, are young folks. They got children. And they're teaching their children how to walk and talk and, and experience life. And yesterday when I was out, it was weird. I think three 
three or four little ch children, year to maybe three, had noticed me and they were waving and hiding me. I had a little kid in the, the grocery store. I was waiting for the guy. He's got a cart and a big, big kid. And he's got that little kid in the cart. Now, it's a, kind of a small store, so we're kind of crowded. And the little boy looks at me and says, hi. And then his father, I was standing there. I said, wow, that's amazing that you, you're teaching your, your kid to say, speak English, too. And he spoke English. He says, well, not really. He's just learning it. <laughs> I, and he, at the end of the little chatter, we, he says, well, I guess we're all very international now. And uh, maybe... You know, the, the ability to speak other people's languages is, it's incredible. I can't do it. I barely speak English. So learning another language and all the rules that go with uh, grammar and being spoken correctly, I can't, I don't have the time or the interest, I think, to put myself in a position to do something like that when all the Danish people I know are more than happy to speak English with me. So trying to learn their language, they, they realize on their end that they're going to spend more time asking me what the fuck I'm saying than they are understanding what I'm saying because of my accent. And, and on the other side of that, uh, a lot of Danes think that their accent speaking English is weird or different or whatever. I find it quite interesting still to this day. It's very exotic uh, uh, accent. In English is the Danes and then country to country it just kind of depends it has personal taste I cannot stand to listen to a French man speak English or woman uh, not too crazy about the Italians either the, and it's the sound of English you know as a second language where they speak it with their own accent and sometimes it, it just depends on the listener I suppose but Danish seems to, the Danglish seems to get me every time. And the uh, the experience that I'm having in life is so different than the experience that I read about. You know, like the uh, the link I started out with about <laughs> what, what America has to say uh, regarding a THC overdose that probably never happened. Uh-oh, did I? Yeah, no, experts call bullshit. There you go. I still have it, so I can put it in my notes of this epic, <laughs> in a perfect world podcast without Vincent. Hey, there's Grimner's bot joining up on the chat. And Grim was real clear with me. He says, you know, nobody's going to be up. You're going to be talking to yourself. and Nobody's going to probably hear you. And then, I can't post it on the... what." the thing to carry the story and uh, the, sh the podcast until Grim gets on to show me how to do it because uh, Cirque was home and I, I didn't want to spend my weekend learning things on the computer. So I, I kind of put it off. We'll, we'll do it at another time. But the more I get into doing the radio, actually the more interested I am in, in learning how to be self-sufficient on it. I, and I think a big hurdle of that was Re just really understanding how much of a minority in society my opinions are. I am the crust of the fringe of the fringe of the fringe. There's not a lot of folk out there that believe the the ideas that I believe. Uh, Mary does. Grimmy does. Oh, who else out there? Cowboy Tech. There's a few people. And there even a few names on the site right now. Hey! I think Grim is on. Hold on a second. <laughs> and maybe it's his bot opening the uh, duck game. The uh, RLM likes to shoot ducks. Me, not so much. I like to read things or maybe listen to videos or music. But sometimes I like the live programming. Sometimes I like the podcasts. Because staying up until all hours of the night, for me, doesn't work. I've turned into a go to bed kind of early, get up kind of early guy in my old age. And uh, I like to get up in the morning, open up the drapes, water my plants in the windows. Boring as fuck shit. Things that I laughed about 30, 40 years ago. I'm sitting here doing them now, you know. Uh, I managed to roll one with, I don't care about the 420. That's Vinny's thing. 
you know, or the, or the, the group. I've been smoking so, you know, my whole life pretty much since I was about 13, regular. Before 13, I had, no, 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 no. <laughs> before, not, I think before 11 or 12, I didn't even want to be around cigarettes. I just went, no, 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 no. And as I got uh, rebellious in my my preteen years, things started to change. My opinions about what was around me started to change. And then by the time I was 13, yeah, weed, huh? What 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 happens? <laughs> oh, you'll like it. That was pretty much the extent of that. And when I smoked it, what I found was I felt better, and I wanted to eat cookies. You know, uh, there's my effects of pot are so different than what I read about. People tell me how they end up sitting naked on windmills, singing and all this, that and the other. And uh, it takes alcohol to get me to do that. But pot, I am I am not an extrovert, outgoing person. I'm kind of uh, withdrawn into myself. I always have been. But if I get a little bit of alcohol, it makes it easier for me to speak to people. And uh, too much alcohol, and then I lose the ability. So what I've uh, learned, I think, from Larry Woods and Rob Works were the catalysts to get me into the vibrations and the frequencies. Those two convinced me that they were on to something that the rest of us need to know. And still to this day, there's no popularity behind knowing those topics. You know, Or like Mary and... Uh, Essential oils, the things that are natural in this planet that are good for you, that will solve your problems. Because you can't say cure, the FDA will fuck you up. So I'm going to go with uh, things that will solve your problems. And I've bragged about this before many times. Um, I was ill and I got diagnosed with high blood pressure. And I lived with a paramedic at the time so all my encounters were with people in the medical profession that were convinced themselves that all this stuff was true so I didn't know any better so I went and trusted them now when I got to Scotland things kind of shifted and uh, I went for a, a test they I wanted to refill my prescription because the one I had from the States was going to run out and the Nurse says, well, we're going to need to take a blood draw to see you know, how your liver's, I think it was liver, your liver's doing. Uh, uh huh? You, my liver's doing? What, what the hell? So what the American doctor never told me is, and that what I never pursued my, looking for more, myself, or anybody around me ever pointed to, was the instructions, the insert in the medicine, the things that you're putting in you, find out what they do. I went on blind faith because I trusted the people I was surrounded by. And that turned out for me to be a big mistake. So what I ended up doing was quitting. Cold turkey, I threw the blood pressure medicine away. And whatever the hell was making my blood pressure rise left me in uh, Scotland and went back to the States and just said fuck off <laughs> so there I here I am and uh free of uh free of big pharma since November of 2011 and I'll say this it's a story you're hearing on a radio podcast if you're even hearing it so for you to believe that I would think that would be just as unbelievable as you have to smoke 20,000 marijuana cigarettes at one sitting to do yourself any damage because cannabis will not hurt you. <laughs> Everything we've been taught to will hurt us seems to always be a lie. I wonder what that's about. And then I don't know much about sulfuric acid, but I would venture to guess that if handled properly and you know what you're doing and you're building out of uh, proper materials to encase it, you, that using something like that would be safe. I mean, hell, you, 
you fill your car up with freaking gas and you go out and you do 60, 70, 80 miles an hour in it. So you're in a rolling bomb that could explode on impact. So what's the difference between that and handling some sulfuric acid? <laughs> to me, there isn't any difference. It's the packaging. It's the sale. It's the sales pitch that goes into getting your mind to accept this thing is going to make your life better when time shows us time after time after time all the modern conveniences that we have for as much time as they save you the damage that they do is uh, tenfold now I can tell you by this I don't know if I mentioned it or not it's not real important but a couple of about a month or two back me and Cirque started to be pissed off about the dryer in the in the laundry room here hmm. and Cirque looks at me and she says you know would you mind getting rid of this dryer and I looked at her and I said I thought you wanted it here I don't I don't care <laughs> I give a fuck for th look at all the power it sucks up so that was her you know it's eating up a lot of power and I don't want to uh, and so it was an easy sell you know she hit me in my common sense bone and then my Jew bone with saving some more money. And I went, hey, fuck the electric company. Let's use the wind. And then to, she says, well, it's going to be a little rough in the winter time because you can't use the outside as, uh, well, it, it might not dry out there in certain parts of the year. <laughs> so we'll have to do it inside, which will, of course, you know, be more inconvenient for my poor little wife to do her, her stuff inside the house and not have the, the modern day dryer to knock that shit out and then boom, it's dry. But the uh, the damage that we're doing to ourself with the electricity and that wasted power to, to do what nature can do, if you just use nature properly or your environment properly, heat your house to a, a temperature that will dry clothes. How fucking hard could this be? But uh, I think the uh, the standard that me and Cirque live under is where one of us is always home available to manage the home. We don't abandon our house. We don't leave the animals unattended so that they can, you know, do whatever animals do when they're unattended. So, <laughs> so our prison is so, it's comfortable, I think, is the word for it. And there's a lot of people in the world that uh, they don't seem comfortable. And I, I think that concept makes me brings me to that, that socialism concept thing where what would be good for everybody where everybody would feel like I do uh, on a normal day. Because I'm not immune to bad moods or, you know, being pissed off. It's just it's not as common as you might think because I... I do radio three times a week and have a lot of fucking opinions on a lot of shit that really rubs other people raw. And I watch them die because they don't want to hear my answer. You know, there's a, the bartender couple that I, I like to go to their bar and they have a, a mother. I think it's the, the wife's mother is ill. She has cancer. And I can I could probably go back. I think eight or nine months ago, I was in the bar talking to her, and I had mentioned, uh, oh yeah, cancer. There's a way to fix that. And when I told her what it was, she just rolled her eyes at me and didn't understand, or didn't believe something so simple could help something so huge. And then as the months have gone on, now people are publishing opinions about. Cancer being a man-made disease, it was encouraged by human intervention in the medical profession. But lied to about it. You know, we're lied to about it. Oh, inoculations are for this. When and when you look at all this stuff with a, a limited amount of control, believe this, believe that, or else, and you, hey, weather dork, and then you make up your own, I get a kick out of that, guys, uh, you make up your own mind about what you see. I wonder how many people out there following the, the dictate of the state believe that's what they believe. They just happen to agree with the state. Not that, not the state's telling them anything. 
cannabis is horrible for you. Don't smoke it. So there's this uh, divide in us so socially. And then to this day, there's still people that will swear in politics, holding political office, that if pot was illegal tomorrow again, they'd be all over arresting and putting you in jail for using it. Not for crime, not for anything else. The police will come into your personal fucking space, your home, and kidnap you and put you in prison for something as meaningless as smoking cannabis. So I've come to the decision about society that whatever the society dictates is good for me, I ain't fucking doing it. If they want me inoculated, they're going to have to tie me down into a chair because I ain't going. No, thank you. And, of course, my wife is hoping that it never comes to that because I will fight them back. Hmm. And, uh, hmm. of course, it's easy to say that, you know, on a radio podcast under some phony name like Flash Somebody. But uh, fuck it, you know. I don't. And then on top of it, I don't believe that the, the population here is gullible enough to allow their government to put restrictions on them such as forced inoculation. I don't think it would ever sell here. But, you know, these uh, politicians in their own way are doing other ignorant, evil shit that I'm against too. But it's not as intrusive as being jacked by the cops every other time I go to the store to see what I'm doing. Like, uh, it, like happened to me in the States. It didn't happen to me often. But when it did happen, I was doing absolutely fucking nothing. And the times where I was breaking the law, smoking my cannabis or whatever, I'd have to go outside the bar to smoke a joint. There wasn't, a, there wasn't even a bar in uh, North Carolina in 2011 you could smoke a cigarette inside of. So going out for a smoke, everybody went out for a smoke. It didn't matter. And if you're outside and you light up a joint, guess what? Four people want to do. Hey, can I have a toke? <laughs> and being a pothead, what do you say? Sure, <laughs> you pass it. Uh, potheads are a unique breed. And not all cannabis users qualify as potheads, by the way, people. If you're stingy and greedy with your weed, you're a cannabis user. If you're not stingy and greedy with your weed, you're a pothead. Potheads like to share things with other people. That we're not um, we're not controlled by greed and wealth and dig me I'm cool. Look I've got the coolest this and I wear the coolest that and all that stuff is for posers and uh, posers and prophets and politicians. You know the three P's. Hey, let me write that down. That was pretty good. Um, but I did have an idea. I'm going to call the show today. I don't know if it's going to make any sense with the content, but I like the title. And it's called, The Fed Has Mastered Arguing If a Crime is Indeed a Crime. And <laughs> that's how I see this mess. You know, uh, how can it possibly uh, be illegal on this side of this imaginary line and then you cross the imaginary line, and all of a sudden, guess what? It's legal. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to change that word to prostitutes. And I'm writing notes while I'm trying to talk about my great title for my program today. But I picked a time that was good for me. And uh, apparently, I picked a time when everybody else has got a million other things to do, like catch up on sleep and whatnot. So I, I'm more aware of the lack of listener today than I usually am. <laughs> My hardcore 20, though, at BitChute, uh, there's a small group of people that pick the programs we do on Real Liberty Media. They originate here, and then Grimner puts them out in the internet webs out there for other sites to handle. And we have small followings on different sites, some of us. I'm not very popular. But uh, Grim and Moose have been around a lot longer, and there's uh, there's you know more people that will hmm, reject my particular way of speaking about society and 
drugs. <laughs> drug addiction. I'm the guy that thinks the drug addicted are the ones that go see a doctor. Because I consider that time I used high blood medicine pills, uh, high blood pressure, as drug addiction. Is It was uncomfortable. It was like I had to do this. I didn't want to do it, but I didn't have a choice or I was going to get sick. What I didn't realize is that experimenting on me to see what pills I needed was what was putting me in these ranges where I was could have been a stroke victim. You know, so it justified. See, you're up there in this range. Oh, my God, we need to save you. Now, you need to come down off the pill we gave you to put you there. <laughs> and, well, there you go. Not a lot of folk out there are going to, you know, come up with that same answer to that same problem. Uh, I truly do not like being experimented on. I resent it. Nothing I can fucking do about it. Every one of us, wherever we are, whoever we are, in some way or another, are being physically experimented on by society, and society calls it progress. <laughs> like 5G. Hold on. <laughs> but... And I found out what, when I listened to the playback, when I use my uh, uh, my mute button on here, it makes an annoying click. So it's either an annoying click or me take the headphones off and try to cough as far away from the mic as I can because I likes, I likes to smoke when I do radio. I think that cannabis in its own right is some form of like a truth serum kind of a thing you're not uh you i'm not as withdrawn when i'm smoking or drinking but drinking is like it cuts the inhibitors it's a different kind of interference so to me the liquor will make me more the clown and the weed, eh, I'm funny. Some I listened to some old stuff me and Mary did, and it was just hysterical how we just interact about absolutely nothing and just make jokes about everything. And that kind of uh, attraction, I think, is what it would be called because uh, the vibration, the wavelength that we hit together is unique. And I miss doing the dork table with my friend Mary. <laughs> And I've tried it with Vinny, and I've tried it with other people, and it's never uh, the same to me. I don't have that freedom of uh, expression that flows naturally with other people. And I've tried it, but it doesn't work. And Mary does the same exact thing when we do radio as Vinny does. She's looking at links and trying to figure out what's going to What's coming? You know, what topic do I want to bring up? Wait for me to shut up so she could say, hey, but this. <laughs> and it flowed so, to me, it flowed so well. I had such a wonderful time doing it uh, that I miss it now because it's gone. And it takes me a while to miss something. I think I'm blessed with the ability to not be slapped in the head immediately when something stops because... Life shows you, like me and Vinny, we've had fallen outs where I didn't want to do radio with him anymore. <clears throat> but, you know, I I took the, the common sense road to it and figured, okay, I'm over being angry, let's talk about it and see what went wrong. And if it's got a repair button, we'll push it and see what happens. Now, out of it, I, Vinny's a great friend to me. I mean, it's not like we swap money, we don't share women, we don't, none of that normal, you know, whatever people think bonds you. Me and Vinny get along mentally over the internet, you know, and radio, and, and our opinions freaking clash. And it, see, in my view, Vinny is a statist, because Vinny wants to use the, the rule of law to correct the law. Now, me, I don't, I don't think that'll ever work. I see the law as a trap. I see the Admiralty Court as a losing game that you're just going to get beat at. Why bother? And I've talked about my past where somehow or another, whatever legal problem I was facing at the time, uh, it didn't go anywhere. There was, luck was with me or whatever, and the wrong the cop did 
was probably figured out by the judge and he didn't see any profit in me. So outside of locking me up for the state to make money, they just called it a day. Okay, there's no evidence. They destroy evidence after a period of time. So if they bring you back to court on that charge, they got the charge, but they've got no physical proof that what they charged you with was true. And any lawyer could probably get you out of that one. So the judge just went, fuck this. You're out of here. Go home, boy. And admiralty court is based on commerce. And that's it. So, hmm. And back in those days, I don't think in the 70s and the 80s, the state was so uh, enamored with locking you up so they could get that government funding. Because this is what it is. You know, laws, laws, laws. And Vinny wants to fight the law using their own law. Now, the way I understand this, from my standpoint, the defense, the prosecution, and the judge are all working together to get something paid. Which side pays it? Does that really matter? It's fiat currency any freaking way. And I harp on this and harp on this and harp on this. And nobody seems to ever side with me on it. <laughs> Because we all use it. Okay, well, we all use shitty electricity source, too. So, there's so much technology of, out there in the world, but how little of it is available to us and how little good it does us because it's delivered on a, a shitty uh, service. The service is inadequate. So, the product you serve on that service is going to degrade by the time it gets to the user. Um I don't know. Maybe I don't explain that correctly. Maybe somebody needs to join me on the radio and set me straight about my misguided perception that uh, I understand to be true. But I find it hard to believe that the people that are out of pocket and rude and insulting, and people think I am too, so I am one of them. Uh, but those of us who are interpreted in the electronic world with attitude and you only see things this way and you're rude and that's the person looking on reading it and that's where it should stop but some reason or another we tend to dogpile <laughs> and jump on something and you know uh, my worthy adversary for example all state all the time Fox News, Fox Links, popular belief, mainstream this, mainstream that, military. He's even got people convinced he is military, and I doubt it. I, I lived among military for a lot of years. My relatives were military, my brother military, my father military. Me wouldn't take me. So that alone tells me the answer is I'm not controllable enough. The military didn't want to invest in me because they probably saw through my psychological profile, whatever they gave me, that in the long run I was a bad investment and I would not stay. Unteachable to the extreme. I wonder if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, considering the things that there are to learn are usually nonsense. You know, like cannabis will ruin your life. Cannabis will make you a horrible person. You'll go out and you'll do terrible things. And Wow. You know, uh, one of the cornerstones of me and Cirque is we both smoke. Can you imagine having to uh, meet somebody that on a, every mental fucking level you can imagine, you get along with them. But, oh, I don't smoke cannabis. What? <laughs> that would be a, a deal killer for me. And I believe in my in my reality that if I didn't smoke, that that in itself would probably there would, the attraction would have dropped on both sides because of the opposition. You don't go along with a prohibition against something that deeply to to not try it or use it to find out for yourself without a real deep rooted indoctrination into the state. The state controls us. The state probably controls me in ways that I, I'm not aware of. But I've got past a few of the hurdles, the finance, the medicine, uh, the social acceptance. You know, to, to belong in society, you've got to have a smartphone. 
I mean, people were here don't pay no fucking attention to me as far as that goes. But a lot of these people, man, they live on their smartphone. They're connected. They're sitting there at the bar even or walking around in the streets and they're doing what they're doing on their phone. And me, I got a uh, circ Sir, charge my battery. I got caught. <laughs> I didn't try hard enough to make that the charger connect or something. And Sir got my battery running on my phone again. So I'm chained to my cell phone one more time. But this relic phone that I want and use doesn't do anything except call Sir. I don't take pictures with it. I don't uh, text with it. I don't do any fucking thing with it. Uh, maybe her sister. If... I couldn't find Cirque or something, and it was an emergency. I would call her sister. And outside of that, nothing. And uh, <laughs> one day, I think we had a, a communication. Uh, the Internet dropped or something. So I'm off the Internet for a few hours. And me and Cirque, we, we chitter-chatter during the day sometimes. We send little smiley faces. Communicate some way so the other one knows and this one day we had this big lull because my internet site went down here. So I, when the power came on back to run all this crap, eventually. But in the meantime, I had the cell phone. I called her sister and let her sister know because her sister works where she works in the same um, business. So that they've got communication. They see each other. And no problem. I'll tell her your internet went down. Thanks for letting me know because she would worry. As anybody that plays on the internet would. If your internet went down and we lost you for a while, we, hey, what happened to so-and-so? And I've seen it happen on Real Liberty Media a time or two over the past few years. I've been using a Grim site. And I like chat. I don't always participate. Sometimes I just let it run and read. Other times I got opinions about every fucking thing every fucking buddy says. But... I'm aware that just opinions. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not leading anyone anywhere. I'm not trying to make the world better. I'm trying to make my world better. And my world got better. And I would really like to see other people's world, you know, get better. But there's all these outside forces in our life that, you know, transportation, housing, all these things that I don't feel should be... Uh, profitable is one thing, but what these profiteers make off us is outrageous. That means the product that you're buying, you're maybe getting 2% of product and you're paying 98% in taxes and profits. All right, let's even say 7% because that seems to be the number that, that translated on the crumbs that the, <laughs> the Rothschilds let us fight over. You know, when, when uh, money comes down here, it's very small. Oh, Cowboy Tech has the rain going on. And uh, he's in Oregon. I don't think he might be saying that out loud. I hope not. Cowboy Tech and, and myself have, we know each other from Real Liberty Media. And we do participate on, on other sites because, you know, over the years, the other sites came along. And... I like Cowboy Tech's input. I think a lot of his uh, links that he posts. And when he's funny, he's funny. And when he's serious, he's serious. And to be that versatile is difficult. I like to stay with the, uh, the comedy crap. Because, uh, you know, clown. Eh, everybody laughs at the clown. Ha, ha, ha. But when you're trying to, to instill that there's a, a new way to look at something to a public... No, that, that doesn't strike me as anything that's ever really going to go anywhere. Because the the public is inundated in advertising and work, taxes, laws, and enforcement, and all these things that I don't give two flying shits about. Because on my side, I'm not physically doing anything to hurt anyone, anywhere, anytime. So... I would say that my insult is limited to type or word. And to me, that's not a crime. It's an inconvenience and it's a nuisance not to get along with people because of the way we speak. But crime? No. Nobody's forcing 
anyone to interact with anyone. Oh, let me bring this up too, is Gooberzilla. I know I make fun of Gooberzilla a lot, but the guy is angry, and uh, his anger doesn't, uh, hmm, doesn't attract. It repels me. And he's strong-minded about topics and this, that, and the other. But the other night he was, uh, or the other day, my day, he was insulted or insulted somebody at a grocery store and things got out of hand and supposedly the police were called. Then I read, I'm reading about this, him having this problem in a grocery store. And now he hasn't showed up to chatter on the reallibertymedia.com. So, you know, there's only two choices when people disappear in a in a fashion such as that after making type threats on an internet site you you never know who reads it or what they do with the information and now he's missing so and again i don't wish ill on uh, a guy like uh, gooberzilla just because i think his ideas are insane i'm just the opposition to his ideas not not a physical threat or, uh, I don't want him to get blown out of you know blown off the planet because he doesn't agree with me. What I want is for other people to give up the violence and stop lying about everything. If you do those two things, the third step comes natural. You would go right to cannabis and hemp. But the first two steps are so freaking hard to do. And I know I'm not talking about your honey. Do these pants make my ass look big? Lies. Because those are not important. What you, the little bullshit we do amongst ourselves about the unimportant shit doesn't matter. The things that matter are ignored. <laughs> they're ignored. They're overlooked. They're misunderstood. Whatever the thing is for the people that don't see it in a clear view to make a change, I would suppose. Mm. And cowboy tech smile says smile when you will breathe and live this is it yeah and it's so easy to do but it takes a uh, takes a lot a lot of effort i think i have to spend a lot of my time when i'm doing things i have to be aware of myself enough to control that uh, that desire to, to be insulting or be right I'm the this, I'm the that, you must listen to me, I know everything, nah, <laughs> I got opinions about stuff, and if you agree with my opinion, you're not going to be a popular person in the real world, they are going to shun you, because the, the popular beliefs are shit like taxes pay for the roads, okay, well just using that as an example by itself, Trump was just I don't know, within the last six months, talking about $2 trillion in dollar investment into the infrastructure. Hmm. Now, I never particularly read the word roads, but it would just seem to make common sense that your infrastructure is based around transportation. <clears throat> and if Mary is correct, the terms that we use to define things are delivered to the listener on a wavelength. Different words create a different wavelength. And some people are, seem to be either numb or immune or reject that wavelength. They will not have it. So the wavelength has got to be the answer because uh, if you just take the same sentence and restructure it a little here and a little there, where it means the same thing, but it sounds different, you get a different result from different people. So, I'm not sure if I'm really explaining this very well the way I see it, but um, hmm. I don't think words are the answer to everything. Now, my wife is big on words. She likes to say things, and, and I think I do too, but I'm starting to get this idea in my head about the vibrations and uh, I think I'm I'm in tune with my plants. <laughs> I I know it sounds probably like a bizarre way to express it, but uh, 
my mother-in-law gave me this plant, a little uh, leafy plant, and, it, and it's bearing flowers. But every time she's come by, she comes by maybe once a month to visit or have a barbecue or something, or bring Sark back from the city and have a little chat with, the, with her kid in the kitchen and that kind of thing. And this plant, since she's got it, given it to me, is about four times bigger than it was when I got it. And she says, oh, I can't get mine to grow that big. It's amazing how you do it. And I don't think I do anything. I think it's the uh, the environment we're in. Everything here flourishes. It's green. With this house, in, in the middle of all these other houses, we were in, in a drought. I think it was last summer. And there was houses down the road where their grass was brown. But not ours. Ours was green and everything was growing and still over. I had still had to, you know, she, that was back when Cirque was mowing the yard. And she still had to get out there every couple of weeks and whack, this stuff is too much. Now, I like it. She doesn't. So we have that disagreement going on. <laughs> but I'm, I'm compromising with her. And uh, aesthetics, I understand aesthetics. I know how to perform the act of making something look the way somebody else wants it to. I'm a painter. But... I don't think I enjoy it anymore. So, hmm. and and this new thing with the plants, uh, I've got aloe vera plants that I mistakenly planted with a vine that attacked the roots of the aloe vera plants, and it was after a few days, it seemed obvious to me that the something was going horribly wrong. So I dug out the aloe vera plants to try to save them, put them all in separate pots. And uh, watered them every day. Now they're overgrowing the pots that they're they were put in. So I might be right about this vine. The vine and the aloe vera just did not belong in the same pot. And it's a big log. It's about two foot long, and they they fit in your windowsills. Really interesting kind of pots. And in the bottom they have a, a an area for water to sit, so the plant can always have daily water, never go thirsty. And uh, little things like this that make my uh, make me feel more connected to where I'm at is the, the living stuff. You know, the plants and the animals. I know I talk about my dog and my cat like some kind of old cat man and uh, Hannibal. <laughs> but uh, hmm. pets to me are not equal because they're dependent on my you know my behavior for their survival. So that they won't go insane and, you know, try to eat my foot. So I feed them. And that's it. I feed them, I pet them. And when nobody's around, I talk to them like they're real. You know, like they understand me like a nut job. And then when my wife's around, I just say, oh, I don't ever talk to the dog. What are you, crazy? Only crazy people do that. <laughs> because uh, I don't know. Because we're all trying to be different in some way and Maybe I just take the being different thing way further than it needs to go on verbal levels. I don't know. I don't like to join groups. so. Uh, but I do a lot of typical, normal, boring, horrible shit like water plants and uh, take out the trash. Things like just normal stuff. And that was what I, I think I wanted but wasn't – maybe not wanted but I wanted it in the future – and now that my future has come to the present, so my happiness is probably because things worked out the way I wanted them to. Um, hmm. Now, I put a lot of effort into it, though. Uh, made a ton of mistakes along the road trying to find what I wanted out of life. But I was very willing to follow the road and see where it went to find out. And some people said, well, you know, if you wouldn't have gone there, that wouldn't have happened. And I thought, yeah, well, maybe if I hadn't have gone there, the place I would have been, I would have got uh, shot or ran over by a truck. Something horrible could have happened there, too. Well, maybe being somewhere else stopped that event. And I'll prove it with this. I was uh, invited to go visit my parents in England for the very first time back in uh, 1989, I think. 88 or 89. I the year of the earthquake in San Francisco. And uh, I was going to visit with my parents, stay with them for a, 
about two months and then go back to the States. Well, about a month into the stay, give or take, five, five, four or five weeks had been there. And I was going out to the pub. I was a pub drinker. My folks were all right with that. But this one particular night, my mom, who never said this before, and I'm used, I've told this story once or twice, I think. But she jacked me up at the door and stopped me long enough to say, uh, be careful out there tonight. you know. And that was all. Just that, like two seconds... And then, you know, you stand there and then you got to open the door. And that little bit of time that stopped. Uh, when I walk past the corner of the street, have to go up to the corner and make a right. As I pass the door, uh, the corner of the building, I couldn't have been maybe 10 steps beyond the door. A truck ran into the door. Yeah, I'm still alive, cowboy. And it could be that my mom stopping me at the door for that few little time bit of time seconds whatever it could have been i don't even know that might have been i would have been in front of that truck when it hit that building it's possible i can't prove it but you know the uh memories tend to serve the person remembering them so i'm pretty sure i have the the overall gist of the thing correct and but the space and the time i'm just assuming that there's a chance I could have get got smacked in the by that truck that you now ran into the corner of the building. But how many times in life does that happen that you, know, you get stopped or you get shoved into, hey, go do this right now. And if you hadn't left, something horrible that was coming, you would have been right in the middle of it. <laughs> so you, I, I don't know. They say you never know. I, I don't believe I do. I think I got a lot of ideas. I I think things. I don't know if I believe them. That's an interesting topic. Maybe I'll try to do a little a little reading on the the words, what they really mean someday. But I I trust Mary and Vinny for that. I'm not uh, I'm not that anal about it. I think knowing we're being lied to about major issues is enough. I don't think that knowing what we're being lied to helps. Well, what we're being lied to about. Knowing what that is, what difference does it make? You can't do anything about a central bank. Central banks existed for a long time. It's going to exist for a long time. And the sheep are accustomed. And the sheep are willing to pay uh, interest rates. Because, you know, they've got the illusion, Oh, someday I'm going to make a million dollars and I'm going to be so fucking happy. And I can tell you, I, <laughs> I'm related to people that, that got money and fucked it off, <laughs> and they weren't any happier when they got the money than they were after they lost the money. They were the same person, period. Money is its a tool to survive life for me. What it is for other people seems to be a necessity that if push comes to shove, what are we going to do? Well, if you've been reading, chances are in our lifetime, push will never come to shove. We're just being kept in fear of it so that we'll want governments to protect us from the oncoming war, you know, so that we're not victims of what those people are victims of. So we need this government to protect us from it. And the reality of all this shit is that is government. That's what governments do. They punish the people for the financial fuck-ups that the governments make. Then they blame it on all this other shit. Well, why don't the leaders just get a big fucking arena and go in there and punch the fuck out of each other for you know disagreements and leave us alone? Why is it a you know military? They have to go off and fight. It's a bunch of crap, a bunch of nonsense. And as we mature, you know, in life as carbon-based life forms, I think that uh, more and more people are accepting, not learning, not not changing their mind. I think they're accepting the truth about what they're seeing. And slowly, you know, slowly but surely, forming an opposition. Now, the problem with all this crap is when you get in government and you start forming opposition against the policy of the sitting government, 
The government immediately attacks you for one of two, maybe two of three things, right? One of them is being anti-Semitic because of all 7 billion people on the planet, there's 15 million of them you can't say a bad thing about. And Obama had that privilege for eight years where you couldn't say nothing about him because you were a racist. Not he's wrong. <laughs> now, if that's not being held hostage, what is it? And I had a big falling out with Chloe over this very topic. Uh, Obama support. He spoke so well. He was a fucking lying thief, just like everybody else in politics. There's nobody involved in politics that is ever going to do anything that is good for us. <laughs> it's only going to be good for them, good for their bank account, good for them to continue living. If you're not in politics, how do you assume that that's not just a gang that you get jumped into and once you're in, you can't get out? If you get out, we'll kill you. You better run again, motherfucker. Or we'll put you under the fucking ground. Try it. And look at the proof. We got idiots like McCain and Kerry and who else? Biden. Freaking life to Hillary fucking Clinton. Lifelong politics, blah, blah, blah. Then you got that sneaky weasel Trump. He hid behind everybody else. Billionaire. Oh, supporting Hillary for 20 fucking years. Oh, the Clintons are such wonderful people. Then he ran against her. <laughs> and now Hillary's a piece of shit. She needs to go to prison. But is that Trump actually saying that? Or is that Trump supporters and handlers doing it for him? Telling him what to think and how to think and about who to think. Because the same guy that's willing to go to Syria to save Syrians ain't willing to go to France and save French. Why not? Oh, yeah, France has already got a central Rothschilds bank. Doesn't need America in there to do anything to anybody. But the thing that the Syrians have is their own fucking banking. They don't participate in usury. That's why the Arab countries are a fucking enemy, not because of terrorism, not because of the way they treat their fucking women. God damn, everybody treats everybody how they want to treat people. It's not... An international fucking thing. If you don't like where you live, leave it. Get the fuck out and go live somewhere else. But, for some reason, these countries have thousands of years of history, of reproduction. They've managed to have babies and reproduce. So, how they treat their women, what difference does that make to me? I don't, I don't care. I don't live there. I don't think I treat men any differently than I treat women. I truly believe I'm an equal opportunity kind of guy. If you're a freaking bitch, I will just, you know, there you go. How do you deal with a bitch? You don't. You let them bitch and you just ignore it. Go somewhere else. Walk away. Because if you want to fight with somebody, like I fight with Hansel, uh, I believe it should be a mutual understanding. You know, an agreement made by two people. Not Nobody's a victim of nothing. I don't give a flying shit about what is out of sight. And it must sound horrible. But the reality of it, you know, I can care all day and all night about Palestinians and Californians and Europeans, but, you know, they're not where I'm at. So their laws and they're this and they're that. And until there's guns and enforcement to force me, I'm cool. You know, I don't care. And what I've been shown is society has an underlying, unwritten way to deal in it. And where you go, it's just common sense to behave in a fashion in society that's acceptable. And if you're a, a badass or an outlaw or a thief or a liar or whatever, those people capitalize on you know, what they would probably consider prey. I'm going to attack them. And all these ideas, these sick fucking ideas that we all have, they're started at the level of government because government's going to protect you from their financial enemy that needs to be destroyed. And all the shit that came of it. Uh, Monsanto got huge because of the war. 
making chemicals to kill human beings, making chemicals to destroy carbon-based life forms of all varieties, animal, vegetable, mineral, you name it. These people are out to fuck it up or either fuck it up or control it. So what we get is garbage. By the end, by the time you get drinking water, there ain't no telling what's in it. In 40 to 75 percent of the United States. Now, other countries did away with fluoridation years ago because they did a little reading and found out what was fucking true and let the public know or the public found out and said, hey, politicians, stop doing this. Now, America doesn't have any control. Uh, the UK, France, all these free, Australia, Canada, the government controls us. Okay. And all these horrible shitholes like Poland and Denmark. Well, Sweden's got a bad reputation because of one particular part of it. But the, these Scandinavian countries, they're so, they're so freaking cold. They're up in the freaking beyond north. <laughs> Why? Why in the fuck do Africans want to live up there in the first place? What African woke up and went, you know what? I think I'm going to move to Scandinavia today. But this is, you know, through the media, this is the shit we're, we're sold. You know, and England has rape gangs, and Sweden has rape gangs, and we're right in the middle in Denmark of all this stuff, all these stories and all these behaviors. And the little place we live is so peaceful and quiet. Everybody seems to get along for the most part. Uh, the drunks drink in the street, don't bother nobody, don't harass. They just have their little group and they, they chitter-chatter amongst themselves. And uh, I believe it's a result of less government intrusion. I think the Danes are just satisfied with money. They get so much of a percentage of uh, the income. But they seem to put it back into the stuff that they tell them they're going to do, you know. They had this uh, road we live on dug up for months and months and months. And according to CERT, because I never talked to the workers, I don't want to bother these guys and hope they speak a little English. I just let it go. I'll ask my wife. And CERT was telling me that the, each house on the block is being upgraded uh, electronically and uh, with the, the plumbing all at one time. They're just doing everything all at once. So it's... It's a slower process, and then the weather, you know, we they were doing it in the dead of freaking winter on top of it. And here we are in June, and they just, now the road is open again for traffic, and they have just one house on the main road that's not totally finished. And I believe that house is for sale, too, so I don't know if it's a matter of nobody, own, you know, at this present time, the state owns it, the bank owns it, who owns it, but it's not occupied. And there's a little road that goes up the hill, and they're still doing a little bit up there, too. But the main of it, the, the main stop in traffic and all that, it was a nightmare for poor drivers around here. They had to actually wait. <laughs> and uh, some of these big trucks, these guys move these machines around like, uh, wow, like parking lot attendants. But they do it with big trucks, and they're... They have hydraulic things picking up the barriers. They got steel barriers down the center of the road and all this just amazing freaking technology they're using. Small uh, small caterpillars, I suppose it would be, you know, the uh, diggers and the whatever excavation they were needing to do. They use these really small machines to do. They bring them in on trailers and they zip, zap, zap. And these kids work like like they're operating a video game. It's just incredible to see progress when it's really done. The thing that disappointed me was because of weather and government and this stuff, it got slowed down to a crawl and didn't get finished quick enough. But they did. And we're next in line, so they're going to be moving down this way on the street, and the construction's going to be here, and they're going to be digging up the whole road and starting that process all over again. But, see... It creates jobs. And uh, there was a comedian that was real clear about that. I forget which one it was. But uh, the point is, you know, you got all these billionaires 
on, in, on paper and such in the world. And they're always out promoting all this political shit. Oh, they're behind that. They're behind this. But what you never see them do is, hey, George Soros brand uh, hemp clothing. <laughs> Why? Well, because they don't want us to progress. They want us to digress under the guise, say, of progress. But, nah. If you... If you see what's going on as progress because we're on the internet, we have instant communication, well, that in itself is a double-edged sword. They will work it against us with like the threat of NSA watching all the time. And the Germans proved this during World War II. It is not the watching you that's important. It's the threat of being watched. And if you don't believe it, go knock on your neighbor that you don't ever speak to. Go knock on their door. Just say, you know what? I'm going to watch everything you do all the fucking time. And then turn around and leave. Don't say anything else. And that guy will be looking out his window every freaking 10 minutes to see if you're there looking at him. Because it's indoctrinated into us. Our nature to fear. Be afraid of this, that, and the, and the other thing. The more afraid you are, the harder it is to progress. Did you know that out there in Radio Land? If I got anybody that ever hears this program, <laughs> probably won't. But I'm having fun uh, still because I like to voice my opinions and read. I like to read the links to a little bit. And it's late night and I'm all alone. So I'm going to call this pretty much. I don't know. I might go on a little bit longer, but pretty much the. Uh, that's it, folks. I don't really think there's any further to go with In a Perfect World tonight outside of uh, if your world isn't perfect, uh, it's because you don't want it to be. <laughs> and that depends, of course, on how you define the word, too, because perfect is, to me, is just what fits, you know, what's good enough. And I'm easily pleased, uh, maybe not in word and deed so much, but in... Uh, I can accept what people do with less anger today than I did when I started on the internet. I was pretty pissed off about it because I was, you know, new and I was finding out all these horrible things about the truth about stuff and and it was proven. It wasn't just people telling me anymore. Hey, look, there's a link that takes you to here and you can see how that happened. And I went, wow, this should catch on. <laughs> and here we are. Nine years later, about, give or take, and uh, still, no, the population doesn't get it. The population doesn't hear it. The population in general, or what we're told about the population, is they're Trump and Hillary supporters. They, they want politics. They want war. They want protection. They want, they want, they want, they want, they want, because they pay all this money in taxes. And then when I followed through with, okay, we're taxes what is all this shit because i never paid any of that shit so what is all this crap you guys are doing well when you find out about the fractional reserve banking practices and you find out about usury in the first place and then you add these things together you find out they make a molotov cocktail that wow once this thing's lit you can't put it out it's it's on so what did i do i go marry a danish woman and because the relationship was more important than the state, we chose, let's just appease the state so that we can have our relationship. It's not a big trade-off. I mean, I guess it is, depending on the person. But I don't, uh, I don't have any grudge against my wife for what she's doing. And uh, I know that if anything ever went wrong out in the real world, I'm a survivor. I know what to do out there in reality, how to get through and uh, what not to do and, and how not to do a lot of things I don't say much about on the on the radio because some things aren't necessary. I, and I don't foresee. I've got a, uh, hmm, I've got a pretty good n instinct for when the shit hits the fan in life. I always see it coming. I'm never blindsided by it because the tells, if you, ignoring the tells does not mean they're not there. It just means you're not looking at them. So when hindsight comes along to use, you look at your experience and you go, ah, I did see it coming. Aha. But uh, carrying yesterday and today when yesterday was a disaster is not necessary for me very often. 
I've learned a great deal from people in my life that have mistreated me. I don't feel thankful for them, you know, but that was the road I chose to be on. So the results are on me, not on them. And I guess that's why me and Cirque still get along is it takes two people, you know. So if you're both arguing at the same time, it's an argument. But if only one of you is, then the other one ain't. Somebody's got to give in. There you go. So when I do something that's wrong, whatever wrong may be attached to, I try to own it. And, and I do that with pretty much everybody I encounter. Uh, if, you're, if you're doing me a favor, I probably, like Grim, ah, fucking Grim saves my butt on this radio stuff all the time. I forget things, or I miss something, or I don't know, and Grimm's never too good to help. But my goal is to be independent of the help, and I didn't really, I listened to an old show me and Mary did, and it, it brought it back that two years ago, I, I couldn't do what I did this morning, which was uh, open broadcaster and go live on a whim, because I feel like doing radio. I'd started the dork table with Mary because it was fun and I had a good time playing around. And it, it evolved into, you know what, maybe I do have something that I can show somebody else they're not aware of by bringing it to their attention. What you do with the knowledge that uh, I feel is available to you, that's your business. Because I can't do anything else with it myself other than know it. But go to the Rob, go to the Larry Woods, and these guys understand the wavelengths we live on in a different way than I do. I'm getting there. I'm, you know, it's a slow transition because I went from do it or I'll knock you in the skull to where I'm at now, where people don't threaten to physically uh, attack me if I'm not willing to kiss their ass. So. To all the ass kissers in the world, I really wish you guys would stop. You're fucking it up for the rest of us. And uh, in a perfect world, self-sufficiency would not exclude the other guy. It's, it's more of a group thing. You can't survive in life alone in the first place. It involves, look around you. There's people every freaking where. So... You don't have to engage them verbally, but uh, I find it quite comfortable to acknowledge the other guy's uh, humanity and nod or wave when I pass by because we're familiar. We've seen each other. It's a common courtesy in this culture where I'm at, this little area, to just be friendly. Whether you're going to sit down and talk to him about the fucking sports or whatever, that's not as important as just being uh, decent as you pass on your way. So, thank you for hanging out with me tonight or this morning or wherever you are in 20% or 20% of in in a perfect world without Vinny. And what have we got? Now I'm all confused on times and days. Uh, so, we go to Wednesday. We've got on the lit. I'm going to do it mentally. We've got on Wednesday night at seven o'clock on the East Coast. We got Miss Mary Graham Z in her Rocket Chair podcast, and she does that on Friday night too. Uh, Thursday, I specifically do a solo podcast on purpose called Twenty Percent Off. <laughs> That's at two o'clock on the East Coast in the uh, United States of America. And on uh, Friday, I think Vinny's on vacation. Ponder Gander would normally be 1 o'clock on the East Coast. We'll see what he does. He might do a mobile. I never know with Vinny. But when I don't mention him, he always gets pissy at me about it. So <laughs> I'm going to mention him. And Grammy at 7 with the rocket chair. 11 o'clock rolls around and Grimner and Moose Girl do the Freakers Ball. This week, I think Moose is on a festival. And Grim is going to be doing balls to the wall. And then Saturday, I'm going to come back on the dork table at 12 o'clock on the East Coast. And uh, maybe I'll have a hostage. Maybe I won't. Grammy tried to connect with me last week, but I took the day off for a change. Wanted to be a selfish little hobbit and go do something for myself. And I really enjoyed it. 
but I did chicken out on eating the pork. <laughs> just uh, I had every intention, but when it came down to physically doing it, nah, I couldn't do it. So luckily, you know, people they don't judge the way we we're accustomed to being judged is way different here. So anyway, Sunday morning. Grimner will open us up with some blues. Well, your Sunday morning. I think he comes on about, I don't know, what is it? Maybe 11 o'clock his time. And he plays blues for a while, and we end up playing trivia. And I played a little trivia this week. Not not a lot, but I, I hung in a little bit. Had a few answers right. Felt pretty good. But I'm telling you, these people are smart that play with us. And uh, four of us will have the right answer all within a second of each other. And all this computer stuff is... The faster you type, the better you are. <laughs> and then Hal Anthony comes on at 3 o'clock from behind the woodshed for our, uh, all that logical legal analysis and answers to you know important problems for those of you that participate. Monday night at 7 p.m. on the East Coast, Grimnir comes back with Grim Leftovers from what he couldn't get to on Freaker's Ball. Because of the annoying rock and roll he plays. Because <laughs> they play a few sets of rock and blues and whatnot. And it just interrupts with their chat time. So they can't get to all the stories. And so he does it on Monday night. And then next week, I'm going to continue with this 8 in the morning Denmark time. And see you know, if I get an audience or not. This is ultimately for me, like Vinny. You know, to leave a record of, of the things that crossed my mind or... The, the links that interest me to, you know, show them to other people and give other people a chance, you know, to see what's going on in the other side of the world that they might not know is there. Uh, and I'm going to close out with that. Thank you and have a good night's rest. Bye. <laughs>